My father told me a story of a man who was given a job as a janitor at the school. His job was to lock the gate every day at 6 p.m. And then some people in the neighborhood came and uh, informally redistributed the fence. Uh, some of you would say stole the fence of the school. This man faithfully locked the gate, but the fence had been stolen. Uh, and the purpose of locking the gate was to ensure safety. If the fence is stolen, put back the fence. So let me s explain what this. A young Zimbabwean businessman called Busisa Moyo characterized the problem of Africa. He said, we are not broke, we are broken. <laughs> right? And there is a difference. It's a very wealthy continent in terms of its human resource. When, Afri when uh, the United States decided to appoint a head for PEPFA, they took away from uh, my senior here, the chairperson of the African Union, his head of Africa CDC. They are African strategically, or black persons strategically heading very strategic institutions in the global north. Why am I saying this? My elder Ashraf asked me about narrative. There are five modes of narrative. First mode is action. That's what I think the chairperson of the African Union is saying, that people will not believe what we say until they see us act according to our beliefs. Pan-Africanism is not a theory. It's the lived solidarity that made the Ethiopians give Nelson Mandela a passport, that made Senegalese civil servants contribute one dollar each every month for the liberation of South Africa that made Zambia take care of us as Zimbabweans and South Africans as we fought for our liberation, that made Uganda take care of the comrades that now run this country. If Pan-Africanism has no active solidarity action, no active affirmative action, the words are meaningless because even the devil can quote scripture. The second <laughs> is dialogic. We have for too long used authority to govern our people and not dialogue. And in this respect, I must commend my colleagues and comrades here in Rwanda because they are able to hold leadership meetings where citizens talk to leaders. I am hoping the African Union chairperson and um, the African Union Commission chairperson can actually convene with ECOSOC a conference each year of the citizens, not just NGO, a conference of the citizens drawn from the, the continent and talk because often we only get to talk to our leaders in conferences in the United States and in Europe and thought there is no pan-Africanism without doing what Michelle Mugo said create liberated zones of pan-Africanist thought when we think it's our European theorists who are thinking when we speak it's our American teachers who are speaking it is okay to have gone to America to learn it is okay to have gone to Asia to learn but what is the influence of African intellectuals and thought on what the African Union does, on what our governments do, on what our civil society does? Number three, we need to describe oppression. I, I, I'm sorry, uh, I hear this a lot when I come to Rwanda. Uh, you have to hear me, I'm Rwandan, so you cannot do anything about me. I have immunity here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you people like to say, let's forget, let's not blame anyone. Uh, please, stop that nonsense. Uh, when the Holocaust happened against the Jews, it was 1940s, 45. Not a single African country other than Ethiopia and those who had not been colonized was free. The first African country got independent, 1957. There is not a single Jewish person who will allow you to forget the Holocaust. And it's, in fact, there are crimes, not just in Israel, across the world against denial of the Holocaust. U.S. foreign policy, Israeli foreign policy, is very key. It's a central issue. Africans, for some reason, must forget something that happened 50 years ago, if you are Zimbabwe, 80 years ago. Listen, we must always remind our friends from Europe and elsewhere that slavery was a crime against humanity as is colonialism and neocolonialism. That killing Sankara in 1984 because you are opposed to communism and plunging his country into chaos that you are now trying to solve as a problem of poor governance is a shared responsibility. So we will take responsibility for our nakedness. 
But for goodness sake, for goodness sake, a, a naked emperor cannot lecture us about how to be clothed. <laughs> and I'll tell you the contradictions. When Europeans first came here, if you come to the south of the continent, uh, ladies did not wear long skirts. And they did not cover their top. Then they said, no, 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 that's indecent. So we covered everything, including the head. <laughs> and then the Europeans have decided to go nude now. Now the dress code in Europe is pre-colonial Africa. <laughs> and then when our kids try and dress up that way, we say it's an African. We are confused around ownership. So lastly, Chairperson, uh, the taboos. You see, Chairperson, we need to talk about global anti-black racism the treatment of African migrant laborers in the Middle East, in the Arab world, and in the Asian world, and in Europe, is a matter for the African Union to constantly pronounce itself on. And I'm glad, Chairperson, you issued a statement on George Floyd, but I'm waiting for the African Union resolution from last January on reparations. There was a formal policy of the United States government in 2015 for reparations by companies behind the Holocaust. There needs to be, the conversation on reparations is not to be settled by African political elites, right? Today, Zimbabwe is paying back white commercial farmers reparations. But when you talk about any reparations, it's like the black body is not worth repair. What we must do is endure, be resilient, go forward, don't look back, trudge on. But today, with the scramble of Africa that PLO was talking about, they will interfere here whether we put in place the right policies or we put in place the good governance. Why? They need the lithium. And if your right policy is not consistent with their green energy transition that they control, they will take you out and they will cause instability. We cannot do it as single countries. We are not uniting because it's the, the good thing to do. We are not uniting because it's the principal thing to do. If we don't unite, we will perish. If each one of our small countries, as economically unviable as we are, rush in order to prove distinctiveness, I'll tell you what will happen. We will be so fragmented intellectually, politically. Our institutions will have no meaning. Let me end with uh, something more positive. I think Pan-Africanism flavor is alive today. You adults, you only listen when you have had a few glasses of wine to <laughs> Afrobeat. And of course, you don't like this thing. They are always singing about body parts and so on and so forth. I want to suggest to you, one of the most revolutionary things that uh, the African Union, under the leadership of the, the chairperson here, has done, is to talk about arts, culture, and heritage, not as entertainment, not as add-on but as part of imagining the future economy, is to talk about the digital, not as part of little things you do, but as part of building the economy. All that's left now is how do we defend African art, culture, and heritage, not only in Africa, but globally. How do we make sure it is the mainstream of AFCFTA, along with all the other big things we do? And how do we, in the digital economy, Make sure we are not consumers of products that are produced elsewhere and not part of the production chain. Okay. If we do that, our Pan-Africanism is economic, our Pan-Africanism is cultural, our Pan-Africanism is intellectual, our Pan-Africanism is also spiritual.